I made this video series that you're about to see the first part of here for your very talented and agile rock and folk guitarist who would like to play the standards. I see a lot of you have trouble interpreting the jazz chords that you see in fake books. Here I'm going to show you how to use just the six fundamental jazz chord shapes that I talk about in my Gateway to Jazz Guitar book to interpret almost any chord that you see in fake books. So it's kind of a shortcut method, but it works really well. You can get a very authentic jazz chord sound behind your vocals. I'll show you how it works. Let's get started. In that popular YouTube video that I made some years back, I'm showing just three of the six chords that we need to play standards. Here in this four-part video series, I'm going to show you all six chords in two different positions. <laughs> You've seen that popular video on YouTube where I'm showing the most common jazz patterns that we use in standards and that jazz players use when they play. I really promote not using the names of the chords. So my idea there was not to talk about the names and just show you where to put your hands on the neck to play those wonderful jazz patterns to get a jazz sound. I even say just put them anywhere and create your own tunes with them so you get a jazz sound out of those basic jazz patterns. Well now here, when we're going to play tunes out of a fake book, we have to know the names of the chords. We're going to be using our patterns a lot when we play standards, but we have to know how to get those chords individually out of the patterns. We have to also understand how to decipher what we see on the pages in a fake book when we see the standards and all the chords written out. Now if you're not used to jazz chords and jazz theory, you're looking at those chords in a fake book and they can be pretty confusing if you don't know what they're all about. So what I'm going to do here is I'm creating a shortcut for you and show you how to apply just those six chords to play virtually almost all of the songs that you see in a fake book. You can effectively put these nice jazz chords behind your vocals and you can sing all the popular standards. In the series, we'll take a look at a lot of popular standards to see how to use the six basic jazz chords to get a smooth jazz sound behind your vocals. We'll go over all of the chords and jazz patterns for the songs that you see on your screen here. So, you'll be learning the songs as you're learning the concepts for using the six chords to play standards from a fake book that you like. I want to clear up something for those of you that have looked at that popular video on YouTube it says play jazz with just six chords, but I'm only showing three chord types. I'm showing the most common jazz pattern that uses three chord shapes. So I don't show the other three necessary chords. To get those three necessary chords, you've got to get the book and, and get into it there. And you're going to need all six of those chord types to play standards with. And you're going to need them in two positions. We have position one that it's, I start to show you in that beginning video that's on YouTube then there's position two. And it's not a big deal. It's the same sort of thing that, like when you play an E chord down here, you play up here also. Same E chord. Or if you have an A chord here, you got the same A chord here. So we just have to learn to play in two positions. So here I am up on fret eight, playing the pattern that you see in that YouTube video. So that's the first position and the second position, same pattern, same chords as down here. So this way you don't have to play up high, you can play down here. You don't have to be going way up here when you don't need to. So again, those are the three chords in the most commonly used jazz pattern in two positions now. But there's three other chords that you need if you're going to play standards from a fake book. It's a minor pattern. It's kind of a minor version of that basic commonly used pattern that I've showed you here, but it's a minor version of it that we must have to play standards. Now, actually, I guess you don't need to get the book if you're going to go through this series with me here. I'm going to be going through some standards and showing how to use our six chord types in both positions. So I'll be demonstrating everything and explaining all six of the chords in both positions as we go through standard by standard, taking each chord type individually and showing how to apply it, how to make it, and how to plug it into our standards that we see in a fake book. So just stick with the series here. You don't really have to get the book, but the book does go into greater detail about all the fingering and shows you some close-up examples and graphics that I think you'll find helpful as well. Now it is important for you to know the names of all your notes on your low E and your low A strings on the guitar. And I think you do. Let's just check in on that. If you play a simple E chord like this, 
The root note of this chord is the open E, an E note identifying the E chord. If we play the same E chord up here on fret 7, now the lowest note in the chord, the root note, is an E note on fret 7 on the A string this time. That's an E note identifying the E chord. If we take our F chord here, the root note of this chord, the lowest note in the chord, is here on fret 1. It's an F note identifying an F major chord. If we play the same F major chord up here on fret 8, now the root note of this chord, the lowest note, is here on the A string, so that's an F note identifying an F chord. Let's take a G. Where's the root note? Here on fret 3. It's the lowest note of the G chord, the root note identifying the G chord. If we take the same G chord up here on fret 10, the lowest note in the chord, the root note, is this G note here on fret 10, identifying the G chord. So you already know the names of these notes on the low E and the low A string, and we're going to need them to identify the chords that we see on the chord page and also on the song that we're working on so we can correlate the two things together by identifying the root notes. And if you need some help knowing what your names are on the strings of your guitar, you can do like I've done here, make a very simple little graph. I've just got one line for the E string, one line for the A string, and then as I climb up each of the 12 frets, I've got like first fret F, third fret G, fifth fret A, and on the same on the A, you know, second fret B, third fret C, fifth fret D. Some notes have two different names, you know, F sharp and G flat. It's the same note, just called by different names. It kind of depends how the charts are written. If people are writing with a lot of flats, they tend to go with flats. And if they're writing with a lot of sharps, they tend to go with sharps. It's just the same thing. I'll be using this graph as I'm explaining some things on the charts throughout the series. Okay, what is the secret to the six chords to jazz? What's that all about? What is this special method? Well, there's nothing special about it at all, but what may be unique here is all of these chords have a root note on the low E or the low A string. Why? If you get that low note involved in every chord, you can identify the chord because this root note is on your low E and A, and most of you guitar players know those notes on the low E and A. As I said before, maybe you don't know you know them, but I hope I pointed out here that you really do know the notes if you just stop to think about it for a moment. So you can identify and find all of your chords if you've got that low root note on there. Okay, that's the secret. It's no secret at all. So let's get started and see how this is all going to work. Take your Gateway to Jazz guitar book and look near the back and you're going to find these two pages that have all the major and minor patterns in them. And you'll want to make photocopies of those pages and then look for the pages that have the diminished chords. There's two pages and they're formatted differently. I laid these out differently, but they're very easy to understand. It's just a different format. So we're going to have to draw from the diminished chord pages and from the patterns pages. So I've got those pages photocopied here so we can see how the process is going to work. Let's take a close look at the major patterns page here and see exactly how it's laid out and how it works. So fret number one means you start the pattern on fret one, fret two you start the pattern on two, fret three, and so on. You just go up the neck. You've got a minor seven chord followed by a dominant chord followed by a major seven chord. Every one is the same as you go up the neck. Now the major patterns are in the A shapes. These are the shapes that I use in the YouTube video that you see and then the B shapes over here. So it's the same chords, but in a different position on the guitar neck. So in this very first row, we have minor chords, minor seven chords. This is in the first position, and in the second position that I call the B shapes, same thing, all the minor chords all the way down. And then the third row has all major chords, major chords going down, major chords going down. And then the middle row has the dominant chords, and the dominant chords are going to put us into a pretty good discussion to explain just how these dominant chords work. Because you're going to see one row has ninth chords, dominant nine chords, and this row has dominant 13 chords. 
So we'll be talking about that more later, but this is the basic layout that we're going to be referring to all the time. And again, we're not going to look at everything in patterns. We're going to be pulling individual chords out as we go through the tunes. Let me focus in here real close on this big fretboard running down the middle of our diagram page here. This is the guitar fretboard going up first fret, second fret, third, fourth, all the way up. And each of these big numbers refer to where each of our patterns begin. The A-shaped pattern begins on the third fret. The B-shaped pattern begins on the third fret. However, the other chords in the pattern do not begin on the third fret. Only the first chord. So these big numbers here are just to tell you where each pattern begins. But as we look closely at these other chords in the pattern, we're going to see that they don't begin on the same fret. Let's get in real close here and see where each of our chords start that are in the pattern. On fret 3, the first chord is beginning on fret 3. The minor 7 chord begins each of our patterns. The second chord, we see it starts on fret 1. So it doesn't correspond to this big number out here. And the third chord also starts on fret 1. Same thing over here in the A shapes. The first chord is a minor 7 chord starting out our pattern on fret 3. And the second chord, the dominant chord, is actually on fret 3 also. But the third chord in the pattern is back here starting on fret 1. So we want to be able to pull each of our chords out individually and see which fret they're made on. And we don't want to be misled into thinking that this big number is telling us where all of the chords are in that row. As we're learning our tunes, our standards that come out of fake books, we want to think of things in two different ways. We want to be able to use our patterns in their entirety wherever we see them. We're going to locate our patterns as we're going through standards. And then we want to be able to just pick out chords individually wherever we need them in the songs. There are certainly lots and lots of ways to make all of these chords, but what I've got here is the root notes always on the bottom. So if you're playing solo, it's as if you have a bass player with you in a way. You've got the low notes stated in every one of our chords, and you can find all of these chords pretty easily. The first song we're going to look at for an example here in part one is a standard that uses just three of our six jazz chord types. And these are the same three jazz chord types that you see on the popular YouTube video lesson. These three chord types are a minor seven chord, a dominant jazz chord, and a major seven chord. We want to be able to play these three chord qualities in two positions. Whenever we see the chords written on the song sheet, we know we have two different places on the guitar that we can play each of our chord types. So just like we talked about a little while ago with the simple major chords, we can build our major chord on either the E string with our root note here, or we can build it off the A string with our root note here, the same F. So here's our F, here's our F, and these are our simple major chords. We're going to do the same thing with our three jazz chord types. We're going to make a minor 7 chord here built off the F, or we can go up here to the F on the A string and build our minor 7. If we see a dominant jazz chord, we can build it here with our root note here. Here's the F. And we've got our dominant jazz chord. I'll go up here to this F on the A string. It's our two choices for where to make our dominant jazz chord. And for our major seven chord, same thing. Let's take the F, make a major seven chord, and take it up here with the root note here. And now let's make our chords using the A string bass note first. So if I've got a B flat note here, this is an A string B flat note, or here I've got a B flat, same B flat, but here it's up on the E string, B flat, B flat. So if I have a minor seven chord, it's here, B flat minor seven, or I come up here to make B flat minor seven. If I want my dominant chord, here's the B flat, there's my B flat dominant jazz chord, or I come up here to the B flat. And here's my B flat dominant jazz chord using the root here on the E string. The major seven chord, I'll go to the B flat note here, make a major seven chord, I'll go to the B flat here on the E string, and make the major seven chord. When we look at the chords in a fake book, we know we can play our jazz chord types in two different positions. 
depending on convenience where your hand is at the moment, where you're coming from, if it's easier to grab the cord up here or down here, or possibly you have a preference in the sound and you'd rather use the cord in one position or another. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly I gotta love one gal till I die Can't help loving that gal of mine Tell me she's lazy, tell me she's slow Tell me I'm crazy, but I know can't help love and that gal of mine. So that's the idea. We're just looking for beautiful chords to, to put in back of your singing. The object isn't to learn the songs that I'm going to play, because I'll show you. I'm going to break everything down, and you can put your hands just where my hands are and, and learn the song that way. That's not going to be any sweat at all. But the object here is to show you how you can do it yourself. Looking at a fake book, I'm going to show you very closely and very clearly how to decipher the chords in a fake book. And I'll just, I'm going to choose some different examples of tunes that will give us different things to explain and just try to show you a way that you can play tunes without knowing any theory. You don't have to step into a theory class and get a theory book to do it. I'm hoping to show you this shortcut so that you can get on your own and feel like you're successful learning the tunes you want to know that are in a fake book, those great standards. Now on this tune, we aren't going to use any minor patterns. This tune only uses the chords that are in the major pattern. We're not, it's not going to be just patterns, but the individual chords that come out of these patterns as well. And then a couple of diminished chords in different places. Let's see how we're going to match up our chord types with what we see on charts. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're matching up the chords that we see in the Gateway to Jazz guitar book with the chords that we see on the page. And what we see on the page isn't exactly the same as what we see over here, so we have to decipher how to use what we see on these fake book pages with the pages from the book. Let's start out by looking at all of our minor jazz chords. Now, when we look at our song sheet here, our jazz chart, we're going to always play minor sevens when we see a minor chord written. Whether it's C minor nine or C minor seven, we're gonna play C minor seven. After you get the hang of how all of this works, how all of the jazz chords work, you can come back and see if you like the sound of a C minor nine sometimes, experiment with that. But we don't need it to start with. We're just going to make our life simple in the shortcut method and use C minor 7 for everything. C minor 7 is a great sounding jazz chord. You use it a lot in rock as well, but used in the context of jazz charts, it sounds really good. Now the C minor 6, I've got it here in a different color because it's a bit of a unique chord and you don't see it very often in jazz charts. It just doesn't come up that often and it is a bit of a special sound for sure but we can get by with a C minor seven when we see C minor six. The C dash I put there because that is a modern shorthand that we see in professional jazz chart books, professional lead sheets and fake books. It's just shorthand for minor jazz chords. Let's have a look at our chord sheet here. All of the minor chords are in the first column of the A shapes here, and the root notes are all on the E string. I've got them all highlighted in red, and I've written the number out here larger in red also because it's hard to read that small number. And the same thing here on the B shapes, those root notes are all highlighted, and the root notes are all going to be on the A string as we go down this column. And again, I've got a line drawn out here with the number larger, so maybe it makes it easier to see that little number that's on the chord graph. Okay, let's go through our song here and locate all of our minor chords and just see how they match up to our chord sheet. We start out with major seven. Here's our first couple of minor chords, A minor seven and D minor seven. Looking at this A minor seven, let's see where it lies in our shapes over here. A minor seven is on fret five, and that 
root node is on the E string, let's zoom in here and take a look at it, that's where our root node is. So that's where we will make our A minor 7 chord. And our next chord, D minor 7, let's see where that is. Looking down the A shapes for a D minor 7, don't see it. On the B shapes, it's right here. And I see fret 5, and this is a B shape, so the root note is on the A string. You can see it, I've got the 5 written out here as well. Let's see what's next, looking for minor jazz chords. Here in the third bar, I see G minor 9. G minor 9, okay. Let's take a look at what's going on here. G minor 9, it's a 9 chord, but we know we're going to play 7 instead of 9 in this shortcut method. So when you see a 9 written like that, you don't have to think, well, I've got to play a 9 because it's written. It's written minor 9. Where is a minor 9? How do I find that minor 9? We just don't do that. Minor 9 or minor 7 means it's your choice to play the 9 or the 7, but generally you're going to go with the 7 at this point. Later we'll find out how to make a minor 9 and you can see if you want to use it once in a while. Then moving right along, at the end of the line we've come upon a minor 6. And I just said that minor 6s are unusual, but on this chart we see one. And they will come up from time to time. So what are we going to do in our shortcut method here? We're not going to worry about playing it as a minor 6. We're just going to use a minor 7 for the time being, and it's going to sound just fine. So let's see where we find an F minor 7. And I see it right away here on fret number 1. So we can build our F minor 7 here. The root note is on the first fret. But I also see it down here on fret number 8. So you have a choice in this situation. You can play it in either location. So depending on what you like the sound of or the convenience for where your hand is at the moment. So let's zoom in closer here and just see where that root note is. Here it's on the 8th fret on the A string. So that's where we would make the F minor 7 if we want to. Way up here on frets 8, 9, and 10, the root note is on fret 8. Let's go to our next line and we see E minor 7. So we're going to look for an E minor 7 over here in our chord chart. And I don't see it in the A shapes. E minor 7 way up here on fret 7. So it's really up high on fret 7. And that's the one we're going to use. So we see that the root note is on the A string on the 7th fret. That's where we're going to make that E minor 7. Then the chord following is an A minor 7. Now we used it up here as well, so we've seen this chord before, but let's just see where it lies out here. It's on the 5th fret root note on the E string. Continuing along, let's follow our line. We see D minor 7. Now we had D minor 7 as well up here, so we're just using it again. But let's see where it is, just to keep everything moving forward in a nice orderly fashion. It's here, the root note on fret 5 on the A string. So that's where we're going to build the chord from. Frets 5, 6, and 7, root on the 5th fret. And at this point, we hit the repeat. So that means we go back to the A section beginning, play it all the way through till we get to this point, then jump to the second ending. And going along here, we see G minor 7 and... So these minor jazz chords, minor 7 in our case, are easy enough to deal with. There's no big surprises there, not many options. So our minor jazz chord is very easy to deal with. Now let's take a look at all of our major jazz chords. We're going to save our dominant chords for last, because our dominant chords involve quite a discussion. So we're just going to go here and take a look at our, our major 7 chords. So Looking at our A shapes, they're all in the third row here, the third column, and all of the root notes are on the low E string. And I've got them highlighted again in red. All the root notes are in red, and then I've written the number larger, the fret number where that root note is, in an attempt to make it easier to see. And then the B shapes are down on, again on the third column, and here all the root notes are on the A string. And I've got them all highlighted in red and written out larger here. So hopefully they're easier to see. So let's see something about our major jazz chords. We're using major sevens for everything right now in our shortcut method. But when we look at charts on fake books and lead sheets, we're often going to see C6 or C6-9. And they're all equal. That's why I've got the equal sign here. It's your choice. You can choose to use any one of these three when you see any one of them written. And often on professional lead sheets, professional fake books, you'll see just a letter name written like this. 
they're leaving it up to the person playing the chart to play one of these three options, but they wouldn't play a C major chord. When you see just a letter name written like this, as a rock player or a folk player, you've been playing for years, and when you see just a chord written like that, you're going to play it just like you see it. You'll play a C major chord. But in jazz, we don't do that. This is just kind of a shorthand for us in jazz. We would rarely play a C major chord with nothing on it, a C triad, we would say. We would always choose one of our jazz options because we're looking for a jazz sound. But in our shortcut method here, we're just going to play C major 7. It's going to work for us whether we see any one of these three options. We're going to use the C major 7 now to get started in our shortcut method. Later, we'll find out how to play a C6 and a C6-9. And the C6 will be important to us, but right now we're just going to play everything C major 7 so we can get the ball rolling and learn how to get a good jazz sound when we're playing standards. Okay, with all of that in mind, let's find out where our major jazz chords are here in our song sheet. We start right out with a C major 7. And our C major 7, let's look on the A shapes in the third column. Don't see it there. Let's go to the B shapes. And here it is. And let's take a close look at where that C major 7 is. Find out where the root note is. The root note is on the A string. So that's where we're going to make our C major 7. And we're going to find it quite a few times here in the chart. So we'll be coming back to that. Let's continue on a little bit. And here it is again, the same C major 7. And that's where we found it here, root note on the third fret. Then at the end of the first line, we find an F, just a plain old F. So this is what I was talking about here, just a letter name. We're going to play one of our jazz chords. It's our choice, but we wouldn't ever play just a simple major chord. So what we're going to do here is use an F major 7 in our shortcut method here. We're not going to use any of these other choices. Later we can find out about that, but right now for our shortcut method, just F major 7. So let's see where that is. Going down here in our A shapes, whoop, there it is right there. And we find out that the root note is on fret 1 on the E string. Let's continue on the second line. Second line, we come to C6. So C6, what does that mean? C6, we're going to play a C major 7 in our shortcut method. Later we'll find out how to play a C6 because it is a chord we want to know and want to use in certain spots. But for right now, for our purposes, we're just going to use C major 7 and it's going to sound very nice and give us a good jazz sound. So let's see where that is. Well, we just use it in the beginning chords, right? So it's up here with the root note on fret 3 on the A string. Continuing on, we see the same C6 here in the second ending. So really, in the entire song, we just used C major 7 and F major 7. the dominant chords. Let's see what the big deal is with the dominant chords. And it is a big deal. It's particularly a big deal for rock guitarists who have been playing dominant chords pretty much in just one way for their entire guitar playing career. It's much different than the way that jazz players look at dominant chords are classical players. It's really a, a different perspective on what a dominant chord is. Now I've got a page in the book that I hope you'll read that says dominant chords of all things. And just to make it a little more visible that C7 equals C9, C7 equals C13. So what is the riddle here? The seventh chord, C7 or E7, A7, B7, D7, G7, all of the seventh chords are used a lot in rock and folk music. I mean, really a lot. It's one of our common chords in rock tunes. When you play a seventh chord, it's more correctly stated C dominant seven, or E dominant seven, A dominant seven. But we just leave the word dominant out, and most rock players, it never entered their vocabulary. They never heard that word in between. But that's what it is. It's more correct to say C dominant seven. Now, a dominant is much larger than just a seven chord. It's one of the choices you can make for a dominant chord. But you can also make a C dominant nine or a C dominant 13. And they're really 
the same in a way because you can choose to use any one of these three chords any time you see any one of these three chords written. So if I see C7 written, I can play a C9 or a C13. Or if I see C9 written, I can play a C13 or C7 or C9, and so on. Now, what it's all about is that the 9 and 13 have a jazz sound, and these are our common dominant jazz chords. We don't do anything special with them. They just We call them the, the, the common dominant jazz chords. The 7 doesn't have much of a jazz sound. So if you use a plain C dominant 7 when you're playing a tune, it's going to erode the sound of the jazz chords. So we want to always choose a C dominant 9 or a C13. There also is a C11, a C dominant 11, but it's not used very much. And that's a subject for another discussion, but not in this one. We're going to stay with the common dominant chords. And those common dominant chords are the ones that I have in our patterns here. In the middle row of the patterns, I've got a whole row of dominant 9 chords and a whole row of dominant 13 chords. Now, when you play a pattern, the decision is made for you which, which one to choose, 9 or 13. Now, this is a stumbling block for a lot of rock players because it's a new concept. It's a new idea. You've had a lifetime of playing 7 chords with a regular C dominant 7. You see a G7, you're going to play a G dominant 7. If you see this A flat 7, you're going to play it just like you've always learned to play 7th chords. But now when we're playing jazz chords and looking at standards, we don't want to use that. Actually, for jazz players, when we see a chord written with a 7, it's a shorthand for dominant. And most professional jazz charts only write 7 for everything, just like this one. You can see everything's written as a 7, but that doesn't mean it's played like a C dominant 7 like you've been used to playing it. It means you can choose either a 9 or a 13 when you see 7. And there's actually more choices. The more you evolve in your, your jazz understanding, jazz chord understandings, you can do different things with these 9 and 13s. But these are in their simple form. And it's all we need to accomplish a jazz sound is to play them in our simple form. Later we can alter these chords a little bit. And players are free to do that. Whenever they see seven written, they know they have a choice to play the dominant chord in many ways. So I know this is a new concept for rock players because I've had the discussion many times with students. So what I'm going to do as I go through the tunes, we're going to be looking at several tunes here in this, this lesson, in this study. And I'm going to make a big emphasis on the seven every time we get there because it's about reprogramming yourself for what you have grown used to. And when you see a seven written, it's an instinct. You will grab a C7 shape or a G7 shape, an A flat seven shape. You'll go right to it because that's your instinct. That was your training, we can say. That's how you, you uh, have always played them. But we want to try to break that conditioning and move our chords into nines and thirteens to start with to give us a great cohesive jazz sound in our tunes. So let's go through the tune here and see exactly what I'm talking about. So let's look for our dominant chords. Our dominant chords are going to be written either as a 7, a 9, or a 13. So let's give a look out for those. Okay, let's take a look at our song sheet here and locate all of our dominant chords and match them up to our chord sheet here that has our jazz chord shapes. Starting right out, we find our first dominant chord here. It says G dominant. It says G7, but we know that 7 is shorthand for dominant, and we can play 9 or 13. And all of our 9s are here in the A shapes, with the root note located on the A string, and all of our 13 chords are in the middle row over here in our B shapes, the root notes located on the E string. Okay, let's search for that G dominant chord. I don't see it on any of the A shapes line. So let's look on the B shapes. I'll come down here, and there it is. So there's the dominant chord that we're going to use. And let's get a little closer, look there, and find out just where that root is exactly. The root is on the third fret on the E string. We play the fourth and fifth frets also, but our root note that defines the chord is on the third fret. And our next dominant chord is here. It says C dominant. It says C7, and we know that 7 is shorthand for dominant. 
We'll go over to our chord sheet here and we're looking for a C dominant. And here I find one on fret three. This is a dominant chord. Let's get in close and take a look at it. And we find out that our root note is on the A string, third fret A string. So that defines the chord. That's gonna be our C dominant chord, it happens to be C9. And continuing on, let's look for our next dominant chord. Right here, A flat dominant. It says A flat seven, and we know that seven is shorthand for dominant. So we're looking for a nine or a 13. All the nines are in the A shapes, all the 13s are in the B shapes. Let's see where an A flat is. Coming down the A shapes first, looking in the ninth chord column, it's not there. Let's look over here in the B shapes, and I locate an A flat all right here. So let's take a close look at that and find out where our root note is. Actually, we know the root notes are all going to be on the E string. Let's have a look at it though. So we see it says fret four, it's on the E string. So that's where we're gonna start the chord. Then the next chord is right after the A flat dominant. It's a G dominant. It says G seven, but we know that seven is shorthand for dominant. So we look over here in our dominant chords page and find out where it is on the A shapes first. I don't see it there on the B shapes right here. So here's our G dominant chord. And actually it's the same that we had here because we saw it up on the first line, right? So we have it again right here. And we know that the root is on fret three, the E string. Where's our next dominant chord? We're gonna come to this E flat nine. E flat nine is a dominant chord. So we just say it's an E flat dominant. We know that if it says nine, seven or 13, it's just a dominant classification. We can play 13 or seven when we see nine. Nine just means dominant, just the same as seven means dominant. And it's your choice whether to play 13, nine, or seven when you see nine written. You don't have to trouble yourself to think that you have to find how to make a nine chord because it says nine on the sheet. That's not necessary. You have the option to play seven, nine, or 13. So let's look for an E flat over here on our chord sheet. Looking for E flat, and I see it right here. Okay, so we're going to play, actually it's going to be an E flat nine just by coincidence. It could have been a 13 just as well. Let's get in close there and have a look at where the root note is on that E flat chord. We know that all the root notes on these A shapes are all on the A string, but let's just have a close look at it here and we find out that it's the sixth fret on the A string. That's our root note for our E flat dominant chord. And then we come along to G7 and we know that seven is shorthand for dominant and we already saw a G dominant chord up here on this line. Now then it repeats, here's our repeat sign. It goes back to the top, repeats these bars till it gets here and then jumps to the second ending. So let's see what we have here. We go out here and we see C7 and we know that seven is shorthand for dominant and we already had that on the first line. So going on to the bridge, we have, uh, So that's the process. We're matching up the chords to what we see in the tunes. Uh, I hope I didn't lose you on it, and I hope it didn't leave more questions for than it answered. We have to decipher what we see in those charts to get them over to the chords that are in the book. Now we have not looked at two more very important chords that are in the minor pattern that we have to have. We just started with this chart here that didn't use those two extra chords because it's just too much at one time. So I started with just this. If you can get the idea of that this, you see how it works, the next charts are going to be that much easier because we've got this idea covered about the dominant chord. The dominant chord is the big one. And as I'm going through the tunes, we're going to go through some tunes here evolving with, with different ideas that are really necessary. I'm going to keep coming back to that dominant chord and stressing it because it's pretty hard since you've had a lifetime of playing, when you see seven, you play a seven chord, but we don't do that in jazz. The jazz dominant chord has more color, is what we say. That's the term we use. Jazz chords have more color than our simple chords. The, the rock chords are wonderful, but they lack that jazz color. And you don't want to use the jazz color in rock tunes. It just, it's out of place. So it's similar the other way around. The, the rock chords are kind of out of place with the jazz tunes for the most part. What I do, just to make sure you know, if you've got the first video that, uh, that goes along with the Gateway to Jazz book, I talk about it a lot. I make my chords to suit my way of playing, my own hand. Uh, and I like to play just 
four strings and I pull my strings. So if I make a major seven chord like this, I'm just pulling these four strings and I'm not playing that one. That one's naturally muted the way the finger lays over it. Uh, so this is my way of playing. So as I talk about in that first lesson, you've got your own way of playing, your own way your hand fits, how big your fingers are. And some players like to lay their thumb over the top. I don't, but you just use your own comfort zone. So a lot of players aren't comfortable with playing just four strings like I do. And a lot of you might use a pick, which changes things. So it's, it's, you make your own modifications on it and that's okay. So just keep that in mind when you see me playing it, like I'll play a minor seven chord and you'll see my finger go like that. But I'm just playing these four strings. I'm not playing this one. I'm pulling the ones I want. It's these three and this one. These are the fundamental notes of the chord. That's what I'm always looking for is just nice, clean, trim chords. Let's look at something from a different perspective here about our dominant chords. If you're used to making a seventh chord in this position, a dominant seventh chord, so here we've got a G, dominant seven. If you're used to making a seventh chord like this, all we have to do to turn it into a dominant 13 is put our little finger right here. So it's in the same line here as where your ring finger is, right down here. Now we have a beautiful G dominant 13 chord instead of a G dominant seven. Not much to it. Now let's see how we make a nine out of a seventh chord. If you make a seventh chord in this position, a dominant seventh chord, this is a C dominant seven, what we're going to do is take this index finger and move it up so it's right under where the little finger is. But to do that, we've got to refinger the chord. I'm going to keep these same three strings here. Just keep your eye on those strings. I'm going to refinger it like this. It's the same three strings. And now my little finger can go here. So we've turned the dominant seven into a dominant nine. So that's all there is to it. We're just changing the simple dominant seven into a jazz dominant nine or 13. So that gives you another perspective to look at things and you see how easy it can be to turn dominant sevens into nines and thirteens. Let's look to see where our patterns are in the tune. And this is actually where we should have started. And it's what you should do with any tune that you begin to work on is look for the patterns. I didn't want to start with looking for the patterns here because I wanted to just look at the process of matching up the chords without seeing the patterns. But when we know where the patterns are, it makes things easier for us. So let's spot the patterns and then we'll see how it makes things easier. Okay, so the way we spot a pattern is we look for a minor chord first, and then we see if it's followed by a dominant chord. So minor to dominant is almost always signifying that it's a major pattern, minor to dominant. It's not every time, but I'm going to say really most times when you see a minor chord followed by a dominant, that means it's a pattern. So let's see how that concept works here. Let's start right at the beginning, major chord, minor chord, followed by a minor chord. So that's not going to be one of our major patterns. But minor chord followed by dominant. Okay, that's a good bet that it's a pattern. Let's look for our D minor here on our chart. D minor, we've got it here on fret 5. So D minor, followed by G dominant, followed by C major 7. So sure enough, it is a major pattern. So let me just give it a mark here. That's our first major pattern. Three chord major pattern. Now moving right along, we've got a minor followed by a dominant. So chances are it's a major pattern. Let's look for G minor here and see what happens. G, G minor here on fret three. So we've got G minor seven followed by C dominant. It says seven here, it says nine here. It doesn't matter, dominant is dominant. And then it's followed by an F major 7. So that really gives us more confirmation. This is another major pattern right here. And we've got a minor chord followed by a minor chord. So that's not a pattern. Minor chord followed by a minor chord. Not a pattern. Now, here's an interesting situation. Minor chord followed by dominant. But this time, maybe it's not a pattern. Let's see what happens. 
And the way we can find out if it's a pattern or not is check out our sheet here and see if the following dominant is the one that follows it here. So look for an A minor 7 up here on fret 5. The second chord in the pattern is D. Here it's A flat. So we're going to say it's not a pattern. It's one of the exceptions. It's not a pattern. So you have to check it out. You know, look, and you can confirm it over here. Uh, and the better you get, the more the years go by and you get good at the whole process, you'll, you'll get very good at spotting them. But when you're just starting out, just refer to the chart to find out if it's a pattern. And then what's next? We have a dominant chord. Then, okay, here's another minor followed by a dominant. But we used it up here, so we know that this is also a pattern. And then at the end of the second ending, we have the minor to dominant, just like we did up here. So minor to dominant, so that is also, we know that's a pattern. And it goes to the F, which finishes off the pattern, just as it did here. We had minor dominant, and then going to the major chord. And that's what we found over here when we were on the G minors on fret 3. Minor. The G minor to C dominant to F major jazz chord. Then moving along, we've got the diminished and then the major chord dominant. Here's a minor chord followed by a diminished, so that's not going to be a pattern. Minor chord followed by dominant. Okay, what's going on here? Let's see if it is. D minor 7, I see on fret 5, but it's not followed by the D7. It's a G dominant chord. So not a pattern that not a pattern we're using here okay and now d minor again there's a d minor followed by a dominant so here's a pattern d minor to g this time it works d minor to g so we can circle that one we've got a lot of patterns in this song it's followed by another dominant chord and here at the a section at the end which is the same as the a section at the beginning so we've got all of these patterns so how this makes things easier for us is when we see a pattern, we know it's a succession of either two chords or three chords. And so that makes things nice. So this D minor 7 to G dominant to C major 7 chord, we go to here and we just play these three chords in a row. And if you have practiced these chords or experimented around with them, then you're already having familiarity with this three chord combination. And here is the three chord combination. So this just makes life very easy when you see a, a pattern. And the same here, the G minor 7 to C. So here it's a two chord pattern. And if you're used to playing that pattern already, just from sliding the chords around, you know it's going to be easy. You've got a point where you can just kind of breeze through. Oh, it's three chords. Yeah, so you can just breeze through these three chords both times. And then you're using these other chords individually and looking for the next patterns. And here's one up here, and here's one up here. So it really makes nice easygoing spots in the tune and also makes easygoing spots for improvisation the more you evolve and experiment with improvising over the jazz chords because you've got three chords that are very familiar and they all use pretty much the same scale so that makes life easy also. When I'm playing an unfamiliar tune if I'm out on a gig and a singer hands me a song or, or uh, somebody in the band hands me a song what I do right away is I scan the chart to see how many patterns are in the song, if it has any, and hopefully it does, because I know if there's patterns I recognize, then it's going to be a lot easier to play the tune, because I know my patterns very well, so I don't have to worry about that at all. I just pay more attention to the chords that aren't in a pattern, but when I hit the pattern, I can just take it easy. Now we're trying to learn how to use these six basic chords to play the songs in a fake book. So you've got to get good fake books to do this. And there's not really that many good fake books to choose from. There's a lot of them on the market. But for what we're doing here, you need to have fake books written by a good jazz player with a jazz concept who understands how to put patterns together and how to present things clearly on the page. There's a lot of fake books out there that aren't coming from a jazz chord perspective. There's a series of fake books I recommend to all my students, and I suggest you get those. They're called the Real Vocal Book Series by Hal Leonard Publishing. Now there's four different ones. You can start with one, get volume one. These books are presented in a great jazz perspective. It's going to make understanding and learning the tunes so much easier.
you don't have a lot of useless chords or confusing chords cluttering the page. Everything is cut down to the basics. So that's the series I recommend to start with. Get all four of those volumes. It's got most of the popular standards that everybody knows. If you're working from an old fake book, old style, or just some sheet music, there's going to be often such a clutter of chords that don't make any sense. And what I'm showing you here, you'll have a hard time applying it to some old style fake books that aren't written from the right perspective. So I can't recommend it strongly enough. The Real Vocal Books High Voice series. You're using these chords to back up your own singing or somebody else's singing. So you're going to want to transpose them to get them where you want them. It feels good in your voice. So I'll be showing you how to do that using the iRealPro app. And I've got a YouTube video here I made that explains how to do that. I get into it in depth, how to use the iRealPro app. If you don't have it already, I recommend it highly. Almost all professional musicians use this app when they want to transpose songs quickly or they're on the bandstand playing with unfamiliar players and a singer comes up, wants to sing a song in a certain key. And in this case, you're the singer or you're accompanying the singer with your guitar. So I made this video for my piano students, but it's the same thing for guitar. You'll be able to understand it without having to know anything about piano. So look for that on YouTube. Just put in my name, and my name's Glenn Rose, in case you forgot, and just put iRealPro after it, and it's going to pop up here on YouTube. And you get all the instruction you need about how to change the keys on songs. And you can run them through every key until you find the key that's best for you to sing it in and easiest and best for you to play it in. Okay, so that's a good sample of the lesson series here about how to use the play jazz with six chords idea playing standards. And I hope you're interested in it. So this is just the first part. There's a lot to cover in the videos that follow this. Is, it's a few videos in the series. I'm going to cover lots of situations that you'll see in fake books. At this point, I've got four lessons in our series here. And if I get enough interest, then I'll continue to make more lessons. And using popular standards, for examples, and going through chord by chord and showing which positions to use and pulling out all the patterns.